839, uh, first and third Wednesday, Chopper Sports Bar and Grill. Our last speaker uh, is right here, actually. Ag Aggie Vetter talked about her escape from communist Hungary. So we always have like great, great speakers and engaging content. So come see us. So Justin stole part of my introduction, which was uh, he is the founder of the Liberty on the Rocks parent organization, along with Amanda Mill. Why don't you w wave to the crowd, Amanda? They started this organization eight years ago? 2008. So it's been nine years. Yeah. And uh, it's grown to be an international organization. There's uh, at least two dozen organizations, and they're across the world. So it's been a really special thing. Um, I've been doing this for six years. They don't pay me or anything like that, but it is a really good medium for all of us to meet and talk about these issues. And one of those issues, to move on into the main presentation, is uh, whether we need a government at all and, and, and what, what the role of government might be if we do think that there should be one. And the way that this debate is going to work, if you can call it a debate, will take a proper format where Team Minarchy uh, will take, if you will, Minarchy, will take uh, the first 10 minute segment and they will give a, uh, a rousing um, defense of government. <laughs> A challenging task indeed for a libertarian crowd like this. But Dave Walden in the white shirt over there uh, would consider himself an objectivist. And to his right, our left, John Krantz, both are very loyal, longtime uh, members of this club. And I have really enjoyed having them here. And I've learned a lot from both of those gentlemen. John, would you consider yourself a libertarian of sorts? Little L. Little L libertarian. Good. Okay. So I wasn't too far off the mark. I hate putting people in boxes, but sometimes you need to. Um, and guys, you can turn on your microphones anytime, too. Uh, debating them tonight will be Team Anarchy. And Natalie, I'm going to have to ask you to move, actually. <laughs> right, right in front of there. Cheer, cheerleaders. Cheerleaders somewhere else. Uh, so sorry about that, Natalie. Natalie Menton is uh, an RTD board member, and uh, if you can tell that she's here at this club, she's a libertarian-minded person also. So if you ever see her name, she's on Facebook. You can find her there, but she could definitely use your support over at RTD. Uh, she's really great over there. So shout out. Oh, she's got I Love Tabor stickers. Yeah. <laughs> we can definitely put her in a box. I love it. Uh, going for Team Anarchy over here is, as I mentioned before, Justin Longo, the founder of Liberty on the Rocks and a graduate of George Mason University. In, uh, you have a degree in economics, yes? And then to his right, our left, is Professor, Professor Michael Humer. Uh, he's from CU Boulder, and you might recognize him. He's been here twice, at least, uh, twice before. Uh, he's given two really excellent speeches. And now uh, we're going to hear a little bit about uh, why anarchy is the road we should choose. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to the gentleman on our right. And Team Minarchy or Team Objective Law will begin. So once again, thank you so much for being here. Gentlemen, let's do it. Huh? Five. Five minutes. Everybody hear me okay? Uh, as uh, Mike indicated, I'm an objectivist. I call myself an objectivist. Now, as such, Rand's fictional character, John Galt, represents an ideal of what a human being is capable of becoming if, of course, they're omniscient. Rand wants to find Galt as the man who always knows what he's doing. Well, I've never met anyone that always knows what they're doing. But it's a nice ideal to be strived for. At the height of the Roman Empire, Londinium was a city in England on the Thames River that was made a crossroads of trade and commerce by a bridge built across the Thames River by the Romans, Roman engineering. When Rome fell, Nothing was heard from Londoninium for over 500 years. It essentially disappeared, as did much of Europe without the tyranny imposed by Rome. 
Now, why do I bring that up as the start of my advocacy for minarchy? And that is because human nature is composed of many elements, one of which, as I'm sure uh, Justin and uh, Michael will cite, is the desire and need for freedom to be able to use one's judgment and to act on it with as minimal constraint as they can fashion. Another of the human nature's needs and requirements is order and stability. And the fact that the Dark Ages uh, followed quickly on the heels of the dissolution of the Roman Empire, and nothing was heard from Europe because Europe was dominated by bands of gangs, tribes, groups, marauders, with the only security being behind monastery walls and other fortifications that might be erected to protect those that needed protection from these gangs. My advocacy of limited government and the order that limited government imposes on all with the consent in theory of all is why I support minarchy and not anarchy. Worst time of the year for a journey. Yep. Yeah. I think we're good. Louder? Should have ironed that. How's that? <laughs> a little better? Ah, tough room. As, uh, as Mike said, you know, I've got to stand in front of a room of Lockeans and preach hogs. And that's, that's, that's complicated even further by the fact that I'm a Lockean myself. And yet, um, I, think there are, I think there are some things to be said. Um, I'm going to go on the uh, American founding. Um, to protect these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the governed. And, you know, the whole point of government, the, the only point of government, what we're talking about, to me, is the, is the ultimate protection of our, our rights, our, 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 our inalienable rights. Um, the, uh, <laughs> um, that I, I go back to the uh, uh, Randy Barnett, Wrote, wrote the second best anarchy book there is. I think Dr. Humer probably wrote the best one. But uh, Randy Barnett wrote the second best one, which is The Structure of Li Liberty. And it provides a pretty compelling case about how, you know, you could make private contractual agreements with a right, rights-protecting organization. But without a, uh, without a kind of, uh, appellate process on top of that, I just don't think that you can, you can ultimately get uh, protections from that. Um, all the uh, anarchists and, and the socialists, uh, a couple of things they have in common is that they can draw out some pretty nice utopian things. You know, we, we can talk about, oh, well, this, this could work like this. You know, here's how it would work and it, it would be great. You, you contract again with a private organization, and uh, if you don't like what they're doing, you, you can fire them. That's great. Uh, I'm an HOA pro, uh, board member, former president, and it's, it's, it's not quite as easy to get uh, rid of even private arrangements as some people think. Um, and so, so the, uh, you know, the anarchists, I, I think the state leads inexorably to one of two ways. Uh, I, I think they say, oh, yeah, well, you have a, you have a constitution, but you're ultimately going to get the EPA, and you're ultimately going to get, you know, the FDA, and it, it's, just, it's just destined to grow. And, and 
I, I think that's a fair point. I think that's a real problem with uh, constitutional monarchy, constitution limited government. It's, it's definitely very difficult to keep the limitations. But I, I think the, uh, the anarchy things also have an inexorable thing that they would go, you know, on the bad way to a kind of Hobbesian dystopia where a very rapacious person could, could take over and uh, mess, with, mess with people's rights. Um, we, had a, we had a meeting yesterday, and uh, Dave, Dave laughed at me for, for invoking LBJ so many times. But uh, uh, LBJ, if you read the Robert Caro biographies, was a really rapacious individual who just, who just got fixated on power and everything that came in his way, the Senate rules or the campaign finance or you know, needing to fix an election, you know, everything that was a block to his power, he was just able to game the system and smash it. And so my, my one concern with an with a anarchist set up with a private uh, rights protecting agency is that somebody can gain that and take it all the way to Hobbes' dystopia. The other fork is to take it to Disneyland. And I like Disneyland and I like Starbucks, but you know, Disneyland and Starbucks are not going to protect your Second Amendment rights. They, it, they, they shouldn't. They're, you know, by Friedman, they should maximize profits, and your profits are not going to be maximized, and you're going to be under threat of lawsuit. And it's going to be best to tell your members, oh no, we'll, we'll hire the security. You don't, you don't need to arm yourself. You don't need to arm Did I beep? I think you did. Am I yeah. done? Yeah. Um, so I think those are the, the two things. Yeah. He's not as talkative. Dave, stop short. Dave, Dave is not as talkative as I am. We, we, we've all learned that. Um, and, and so th those are my, my two problems. The, the bad places that a, uh, a, a private security arrangement can be. And again, I love Starbucks, I love Disneyland, don't write me down, but I don't want to live there 24 hours a day. I don't want the corporate interests that run that in charge of protecting my rights to burn the flag, not get my uh, car searched, and um, free speech. I, I think there are a lot of things that we are given by our constitutional military. All right, thank you. Yeah. So we heard from Team Minarchy, and now Team Anarchy is going to give their arguments for their position. And then after they're done, then Team Minarchy will give a rebuttal to Team Anarchy. So Justin, take check, it away. Hey. Hello, can you hear me? When I say the state, I mean the state, government, I mean government. So I use the state and government interchangeably, just FYI. Okay. <clears throat> Pro Professor Humor and I are under no delusion that we're going to change very many minds tonight. What we intend to do, rather, is to reframe the discussion and reframe the issue in your minds. It's confusing and it's muddled, and for many different reasons. One reason is, this issue is so confusing, is the A word, anarchy. Now, I'd like to strike that word from your minds. Don't think of the word anarchy any longer. I'm not talking about anarchy tonight. What I would like to reframe this issue as is markets versus monopoly. That's, that's what this issue is in my mind. Human beings need goods and services to survive and thrive in the world. The question then becomes, by what mechanism do we produce and distribute these goods and services? Things like food, shelter, protection services, roads, and yes, even the rules under which we live, all must be provided to us in some manner. So the question is, how does that happen? Richard Dawkins has a famous one-liner that he uses that fits very well with what we're discussing tonight. When he's talking with various religious people about atheism, he draws common ground by saying to the Christian, for example, 
Mr. Christian, there have been 1,000 gods worshipped throughout history. You're an, you're an atheist when it comes to 999 of them. I just go one god further. And that's how I want to reframe this issue tonight in your minds. Our opponents love and revere the market. There's no question about that. And they want markets to provide 98% of goods and services. We just go 2% further. So we're not asking you to be anarchists or to choose a system of anarchy, because that makes no sense. It's nonsensical. What we're asking you to do is to choose the market system. So why markets versus monopoly? Why am I saying that? The state government is a monopoly and a coercive one at that. It's not like a private company that suddenly comes to acquire 100% of market share. The company still has to ask you to buy its goods or services. The state, however, does not have to ask you a damn thing. It compels you. Meaning, even if we're talking about 1% or 2% of goods and services in the economy, say protection services, for example. Let's talk about protection services. The state doesn't ask you to purchase protection services from them. It compels you by stealing money from your paycheck every two weeks and using that stolen money to provide you a police service, whether you like it or not. We have no say over how much these police services cost us. We have no say in the manner in which they're delivered to us or the quantity in which they're produced. It's just your money or your life. That's it. There is no say. All the failings of monopoly provision we instinctively fear are worse when it comes to the state. The state's monopoly provision. Because the state has the ability to legally take your stuff. Monopoly provision of goods and services results in all the things that we free marketeers despise, central planning, no co consumer choice, no competition, no profit and loss test, no prices to coordinate where the hell things go, and so on. We all understand why monopoly provision of food and healthcare ends in disaster. I'm asking you to apply that same reasoning to things like protection services and dispute resolution. It's not as though economics only applies to things like food and health care. Economic laws don't suddenly suspend themselves when we're talking about that last 2% of goods and services. I'll end by issuing a challenge. The very challenge that, sh that finally cleared up the way that I think about this issue way back in college. Towards the end of one of my upper level econ classes, our professor pushed our view of the market process all the way to the edge. He gave us a brief overview of the ways in which the market could provide the really tough cases, fire protection, dispute resolution, defense. You can imagine what the kind of pushback he got from class. And full disclosure, I was one of those people pushing back against his utopian views. And finally, in response to this pushback, after explaining some of the market processes, he issued this challenge to the class. He said, give me economic reasons why the market cannot provide the goods and services you believe it incapable of providing. So my challenge is this to you tonight. Every time you advocate a government policy, any sort of good or service you think the government should provide, exchange that word of government in your mind with monopoly and, give, and, and try to explain why a monopoly would be better at providing that particular good or service than the market process. That's my challenge. Well done. Hey, testing. Can you all hear me? Oh, kind of. All right. Uh, if I if I look down, you'll be able to hear me better. Okay. Uh, well, so uh, I only have five minutes, and um, you can't say very much in five minutes. So I will try to make three points. And the first thing is, I want to try to convince you to read a book. Uh, this may seem self-serving, because I myself have written a book about anarchism. Um, I'm 
thinking of this one. OK, but uh, my motive here is not financial. It's that I cannot present the case for anarchism in five minutes. It is not possible because this is a topic that is more complex than that. It's not one of these simple trivial things. Uh, the book goes on for 350 pages, and it's not a bunch of repetition and wasted space. And I don't go off on long digressions like other academics. The 350 pages is actually all argument. It's actually all presenting my point. Uh, for a comparison, uh, I heard that there were a lot of uh, Randy and objectivists around. So for a comparison, imagine somebody asking you to um, explain and defend Ayn Rand's philosophy and respond to all objections that I can think of. <laughs> you got five minutes. Go. Uh, it wouldn't work. They would be totally unpersuaded because it's just not a five-minute topic. They have to read a book. You would tell them, here, here's a book, you know, Atlas Shrugged or whatever, go read that. Okay. You have to read the book. If you hadn't read a book on anarchism, you just don't know what you're talking about. Uh, and then after that, there would be a point to then coming and asking me questions or objecting to things I said in it. Okay, the second point that I wanted to make was about um, objectivity. So I hear people saying that um, we have to have a government because we have to have objective law. Um, this strikes me as a really serious confusion about what objectivity is, and a very surprising one for, some, for somebody whose philosophy is named after the concept of objectivity. Objectivity does not mean you know, being in accordance with the wishes of one really powerful person. That's not what objectivity is, okay? That is what you get with government. The difference between government and anarchy is, in the government, there's like one really powerful organization that gets to force everyone to do their will. That's not what objectivity is. Okay, this is a little bit like the divine command theory in metaethics, which is the theory that what's morally right is determined by what God commands. That is not a form of objectivism, right? That does not give you objective values. That gets you values that are dependent upon one really powerful person. Being objective means not being dependent upon the wishes or beliefs or whatever of anyone. Right. Not even one really powerful person. OK. Um, the reason why anarchists um, don't want a government is not that we're against objectivity. It's that we don't think that the government will really protect our rights. Here's an analogy. Why do you not want a world government? The reason why I don't want a world government is not that I don't want there to be objective law or whatever. And probably most, probably even if you're Anarchists, you don't want a world government either. It's not because you don't want objectivity. It's because you don't think that the world government is actually going to protect your rights. And it's probably going to be really wasteful and expensive and it could start a tyranny and et cetera. Those are the same reasons why the anarchists don't want a single government even within one country. OK. Uh, anyway, here's a third thing that I wanted to say. So this is a sort of moral argument that can be given. I don't think that this settles the issue, but it's an argument that can be given briefly. Um, so government, by definition, provides certain kinds of services, um, basically protection services. And second characteristic of government is that it has a coercive monopoly, meaning that they will forcibly shut down anyone who tries to provide those same services and forcibly punish them. Okay, the things, the services the government is providing, it's either morally permissible or morally impermissible to provide those services. If, the, if it's morally impermissible, then we shouldn't have a government, straight out. If it's morally permissible, then it's morally wrong to punish somebody for doing that. Right? If the thing the government is doing is morally permissible, that means that it's wrong to punish somebody for doing that, which by definition is part of what the government does. They do X and then they forcibly punish other people who do X. If X is wrong, you go, they should stop doing that. If it's not wrong, they should stop punishing the other people who are doing X. OK. Um, am I out of time now? I'm probably out of time. Anyway, all right. That's, <laughs> that's all I have time for. OK, so we've heard the pro arguments from both sides. Now we'll hear the rebuttals from each side. And then after that, we will have Q&A. So keep those questions that are burning in your minds to yourselves just for another 20 minutes. We're gonna hear from Team Minarchy first with a rebuttal for 10 minutes and then Team Anarchy will rebut the pro argument. 
<laughs> I, I do feel a little biased because... We can't have anarchy here, or, or chaos. We, we gotta have rules. So, go ahead, Dave or John, whoever wants to take it first, please. I think they, I think, oh, Captain, my captain threw it, threw it at me here. Uh, very good. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I, I think, though, the one thing I want to go with Justin on is, um, yeah, love markets. It's a great word. Um, but markets are, by definition, majoritarian. And, and again, we're, we're, we're not arguing at the right hand of the, the spectrum where I was hoping. Uh, there's a lot of things government does that I agree with you it should not be doing. We, we truly are agreeing, maybe 99 and 98%. But um, mar markets are majoritarian, and I think the one thing government does good is as a counterbalance to majoritarian. Um, I don't know if you've been following the brouhaha Nancy McLean and Democracy in Chains, but she, she's attacked James Buchanan and public choice theory that, you know, oh, these crazy wild libertarians are going to shackle democracy. And, you know, the right answer to that is hell yes, you know, given any kind of chance. Because, um, again, going back to my Disneyland, my Disneyland Starbucks, rights protection thing that I really don't want that in, in majority hands. And you know, the private market market purchased rights protections to me, their fault is that they're majoritarian. And what I want is just this layer on top and you know, nothing crazy I made up, the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights, that says, okay, that's great that you've contracted with that guy to provide security for you, but if I drive through your neighborhood and he pulls me over, he is not allowed to jail me for having a uh, Oakland Raiders bumper sticker. Well, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's okay. Let me, let me pick another example. But he is, not a, he is not able to jail me for the color of my skin or having long hair or something like that. I, I think one of the, we, we complain about government, that's what we're here for, but the uh, idea that we have 50 states you could drive through and have great expectations of, of what your rights are. Your, I always talk about our Coraline uh, products rights from, from Coraline products versus the United States. We got bifurcated rights, but we got some very serious protections on our individual liberties and our, our free speech rights, again, burning the flag or the Westboro Baptist losers protesting the military funerals. We, we got some pretty impressive guarantees of our individual rights. And I'm sorry, I just don't think in a majoritarian market situation we would get the, oh, I've been yapping and I didn't set the timer. What was that? Is that my five and, and give David his five? Is that fair? Sounds good. Uh, can you hear me again? The reason I cited Rome in my opening was not because that was an example of a just and proper government. It was simply to remind everyone what happens when whatever order and stability the markets are operating under, if you take that order and stability away, you get the equivalent of the Dark Ages across the entire area where that order and stability, whether it was imposed tyrannically or democratically supported by the people, when it subsides or goes away, then that ugly aspect of human nature that goes, goes along with the wonderful aspects of human nature that makes markets also makes tyranny. With respect to some of the points that you guys made, well made, I might add, in our country, the attempt was made to make governments competitive. The fact that the federal government has become dominant 
in that intended to be competitiveness is other reasons beside the fact that it was government with each of them having, quote, a monopoly on the use of force. So I would argue that there doesn't have to be one government to which you answer, or each of us answers. It can be many competitive ones. That if you don't like what is going on with one, just like in the free market solutions or the anarchist solutions, you're entirely free to move. My, my reference to human nature and that ugly aspect of it that will demand order and stability and do whatever is necessary to get it means that in seeking it, whether it's in, under an anarchy type of arrangement or, or minarchy, the result is always going to be the same order and stability will be imposed by whoever we elect or we contract with to impose it. To the extent we don't agree with it, in an anarchist world, we simply sign another contract with another provider of it. Well, that works fine, but ultimately you're going to end up with people competing for your subscription, your contract. And you will end up, I believe, if you start out with anarchy, at the same destination you do with government. So at the bottom line, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. And human nature is a part of that nature. And human nature is such that it will seek order and stability, and if it does not find it, it will do whatever is necessary to obtain it, including all the tyranny that we're used to from government. And if it doesn't find it in the marketplace, someone will provide it in the marketplace, whether you like it or not. All right. All right. That wraps it up for Team Minarchy, and we're gonna pass those microphones over to Team Anarchy and hear a rebuttal of their case. Are you ready, Justin? Yeah. All right, I'll turn you up here. Hey. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, couple of common responses and things I know you're thinking about our position. Again, I don't wanna use the A word because I think that confuses and muddles things. We're asking you to choose markets, okay. Show me one anarchy that ever existed Okay, I could show you that, but the better response is, show me one minarchy that ever existed. There's never been this theoretical night watchman state. If you roll back America's founding all the way to 1789 when the ink was drying on the Constitution and you let it, the, the, the game play out the way that it did, does it ever end up not here? Of course it ends up here. You, you wrote down on a piece of paper the ability for people to steal, legally steal and legally compel people against their will. Okay, so that re leads me to the next point of the human nature point. Oh, humans are fallible, humans are sometimes evil. How could we possibly allow humans to be in a market and sell each other things like goods and services? There'll be evil people in the market. That's a better, of course there's, there's fallible people, of course there's evil people, but I would rather them be in the market asking me to purchase their protection services or whatever services than be, be drawn to the lovely, intoxicating government where they can steal and pillage and rape and murder at, legally under the veil of the law. Every, look, every two weeks your, your, your paycheck is being stolen from. And so the whole idea of like a government being this protector of your rights, how do you have a protector of your rights that can take from you every two weeks? We need a government to protect our property. Well, where are they getting the funds to protect your property? Oh, oh, they're taking it from my paycheck. Oh, so, so you're, you're, you want something, someone to steal from you because you're scared of someone from stealing, you're scared about somebody stealing from you. It's a contradiction. It's a contradiction that you have to own up to. So what we're saying is um, human nature 
because it's scary and sometimes evil, it's better to be in a market situation where you don't have the legal compulsion that the state has so that you have this decentralization of power, you don't have this centralization of power. We don't want power to be centralized. And what they're arguing for is power to be centralized. Last thing, you're gonna be coming up with all of these ideas in your head, like how in the world could the market provide X, okay? To ask that question is to totally miss the point. You ever hear of I Pencil, that Leonard Reed essay, where he tries to describe the fact that no one understands how the hell a pencil is made. This pen, let's pretend this is a pencil. A, a, pen, a pen is sitting in my hand and no one can tell you how this is made because thousands of people across the world that has never met each other came together because of the price system, because of the market, they came together and they produced the pencil and there's no one person that knows how to make one. So imagine me, imagine you trying to answer the question, well, how would a, how would a market and protection services exist? You're asking a question that misses the point. Hayek was very clear on this is impossible knowledge. This is unknowable knowledge. We have something in our hands right here, and it's still unknowable. Can you imagine trying to figure out the next market, the next iPad out there? There's no way you could do that. So the reason we have markets is because questions like this are unknowable. You have to allow entrepreneurs to, to respond to prices, and the only way you can have prices is by having a market. When the government provides a good or service, there is no prices, and there's nothing for people to respond to. And in the markets, we have a profit and loss test. If you, don't, if you don't please your customers, you get a loss, you go out of business. When the government doesn't please its customers, customers, what, is, what happens? It gets more money. So the question, if you're asking the question, how would the market provide something, you miss the point. Read Hayek, read I Pencil by Leonard Reed, understand that this is unknowable knowledge, and so to ask that question is to miss the point. I think that's it from my response. Excellent. Thank you for your contributions, Mr. Longo. We'll move on to Mr. Humor now. Okay, um, can you hear me now? I'll bring you up. Oh, all right. What if I put it closer? I'll move, okay. leave it, right. I'll move you up. Okay. Um, well, I don't know. I have five things I want to talk about. I, I don't think I have time. To, okay. Well, so um, we should have government because we need to have stability and order. Well, the argument of the anarcho-capitalists is that the system would be stable and orderly. Uh, you don't have to have a central person directing everything in order to have order. There's a thing called spontaneous order, which all libertarians should be familiar with because we talk about that in the context of you know, everything other than protective services, uh, why you don't need the government planning things. Uh, for example, there's language. Where did language come from? Well, nobody designed it. It didn't come from the government. Um, and, you know, if somebody had tried to design, actually, people have tried to design languages and nobody uses them, right? Um, yeah, Esperanto. Um, or, you know, formal languages made by philosophers. Okay. Um, that's the idea. Now, you know, just saying that there are spontaneous orders doesn't prove that this particular spontaneous order would work, right? But also, like, we don't have a good reason for, like, we haven't been given a good reason why it wouldn't work, okay? And that's just, you know, to sort of raise the issue that we should think about more. Um, the other is, the second issue was um, markets are majoritarian, and that's the problem, because the majority of people maybe don't have correct values. Um, well, response, actually, well, government is majoritarian, at least in a democratic society. Um, and yes, you might hope that the Constitution will protect our rights against even the majority, but over time, we've seen that just gets eroded, and it's, it's not accidental. It wasn't like there were just a couple of bad people, and if only we didn't have, you know, whatever, Woodrow Wilson, everything would have been fine. No, you can explain <laughs> the reasons why this would happen, right? And unless you can figure out uh, something that's going to make a piece of paper have more power than actual flesh and blood human beings that will stop people from acting on their desires just because of a piece of paper that's written down, um, you should not assume that, you know, the government is not going to be majoritarian. You know, unless you want to have a dictatorship, that's the other thing, <laughs> the other possibility, which also doesn't work out very well usually. On the other hand, actually markets are not majoritarian. <laughs> 
in, in the free market, you do not have to get a majority of the market to want your product. You only need there to be enough people. You only need a market niche. So in the United States, there are enough libertarians um, for, you know, for a provision of libertarian law to be viable. Right? Like there could be sub-communities in which the law is libertarian. Everybody gets to smoke whatever they want and they get to uh, sell sex and whatever. Okay, libertarian community. There are enough libertarians in the country, even though they're very far from the majority. So in the market system, you could live in such a community. In the democratic system, you cannot, because it's not enough that there are 10 million. You need 150 million in order, in order to get it, right? Okay, uh, what else, wait. Um, oh, um, Will the system be taken over by a strong man? Well, so this is discussed at greater length in my book, section 10.10. <laughs> Any of you have it? Uh, yeah, there you go. He knows it. Uh, he knows the whole thing. Um, uh, well, the, if you think seriously about it, there are not actually good reasons for thinking that that would happen. People just say that, right? The anti-anarchists just say that, but they actually don't have a good explanation of how this would happen. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult to establish a monopoly in most industries. It very rarely happens, and when it happens, it almost always happens because the government granted the monopoly. So now you need to explain why the protection industry would be different from most other industries in that it would be a natural monopoly. Uh, if you think about the reasons that, um, that determine the most efficient size for a firm in an industry, just in economic theory, uh, probably the most efficient size for a protection firm is going to be very small. Uh, the reason has to do with the fixed costs for establishing a firm in this industry. The fixed costs for protection are very low. Uh, there are other industries like the auto industry where there are very large fixed costs because whatever costs $100 million to build a factory or something like that, then the most efficient size is really large. Okay, if the most efficient size for a firm is really small, that means there are probably going to be a very large number of firms um, okay, it's going to be very difficult to monopolize the industry. Okay, that's all. I'm out of time. <laughs>
is always in a state of anarchy with everyone they rule over. Additionally, if we have multiple rulers in the world, which we always have, they are always in a state of anarchy with each other. There's no way out of that, literally. Even if you go to the one world government single ruler of the entire world, again, they are in a state of anarchy with everyone they rule over. So that's what I want addressed by the pro-government side here. And then the flip side of that that I want addressed by the pro, or, you know, pro-competition, anti-monopoly side go. here is uh, given that we have, have anarchy in this respect, international anarchy, anarchy between rulers and the ruled, why isn't it better? Who wants to start? <laughs> I guess I'll say something. I think, I think it's important, Tim, and everyone else, to recognize the following fact. And that is, just as Justin post postulated that, show me an example, I ask you, has there ever been an example that you're aware of in the history of the human race that a group of people, upon finding themselves to be a group of people, did not try to, in some way, come together to establish the rules whereby they would all agree to function under. Now, I have never found one, and I don't think you can for long. It may exist temporarily, but they don't last that way. Now, why is that so? That's because of what I said in my opening, that human beings, part of human nature, is to seek and protect and preserve order and stability so that markets can arise. They can function under an objective set of rules and by my word of use, use of the word objective, I don't mean the best proper rule. What I mean is a rule that's uniformly applied to all. It's not subject to whoever a ruler might be or their particular influence or whatever. So my, my answer to you, Tim, if it is an answer, is that human nature will establish that means of achieving order and stability. Whether you call it a government or you call it a company with a name who has the power because the group of people within that area have, have signed up for their services, they will attain the power that if challenged, they will exercise it on behalf of the people that sign up for the use of that power. And that's government. market non-monopolist people, we are not against rules. I love rules. I love hierarchies. So the question is, how do rules happen in a market? Well, we see it all the time. It's all around us. We cannot take soda and food into a theater. How did that rule happen? Well, it was discovered. So if you know any little bit of economics, you'll understand that prices are discovered. That's the word we use, that economists use. Prices are discovered. When people interact in a thousand people, millions of people interact in, in market exchanges, there is no price handed down from on high. The price is discovered as a result of all those interactions. That exact same process is the process by which we have rules all around us, all the time. People interacting a zillion times a day over zillions of acres of, of geographic region. That's how rules arise from the bottom up. Hayek called that law, and Hayek called legislation something very different. That's the top-down imposition from rulers, from politicians. Legislation is top-down Im imposed. Law is bottom-up discovered. And so another way to illustrate this point is, do you know what judges call 
their job when they're doing their job and they're not being activists. They say they're discovering the law. It's the exact same process. So if you can wrap your mind around prices, how prices emerge, you can wrap your mind how law and rules emerge. I love rules. I love order. I'm suggesting that our market position provides more order and more rule and better rules that can be facilitated over time than that centralized monopoly position. Thank you. Um, so I want to address something that's related to the question, but not exactly what you said. So you might think, uh, you know, different governments are actually in competition with each other because, uh, you know, I could move to Mexico. So like the U.S. government has to compete with the Mexican government to keep me here. So actually, what do you mean it's a monopoly, right? <laughs> Uh, it's, well, so we, we tend to think in sort of black and white terms of you have either competition or monopoly, but actually there are degrees of competition. And the gov governments have a relatively low degree of competition. The reason for that is the costs of switching your provider are very high. Um, you have to leave behind your family and friends. You have to usually have to quit your job. Okay, you have to go to another society where they don't speak the same language, whatever. whatever. Okay, uh, so very high cost of moving. On the other hand, uh, consider homeowners associations. Uh, there's a significant cost, but it's much less. If I don't like my HOA and I want to get a different one. So I own a condominium. If I don't like the HOA and I want a different one, I have to sell my condo, and uh, there's like a 5% uh, transaction cost, which is significant. So they can get away with some fucking with me without me leaving, <laughs> okay? On the other hand, uh, take something like uh, my phone company. Um, the costs of switching from them are virtually nothing, right? So um, the, the difference between the anarcho-capitalist system and the government system is in the anarcho-capitalist system, there would be more competition, right? That is, we envision that there would be a larger number of providers that would be accessible to a person without leaving the area, and there would be lower costs for switching, and that's why it would be more efficient. They would be less likely to fuck with you. Uh, both Team Anarchy spoke to that question. John, do you want to respond to it, or should we move on to the next question? No, uh, yeah. Okay, do, do it quick. Can you hear me if I yell? Do you have the microphone there with you? Uh, just, just one quick thing on the, um, I agree when we go against the government in a lawsuit, we're at an extreme disadvantage. I, I, I don't disagree with that, but just so much of my foundation of wanting a regularity is that we do, that it works. And we all have, you know, 20 uh, Supreme Court decisions. We rail against, uh, you know, God, uh, you know, that they did. but. There are also quite a few that they did do right. You know, I brought up Snyder v. Phelps and Texas v. Johnson. And um, there are quite a few places where people petitioned. And what I'm, what I'm missing, I guess, from there is, is that kind of appellate process. Uh, I'm great with a greater role for private arbitration. But, you know, if you don't like it and if it's a substantive complaint, you have there's no appellate process, there's no place to go. And the other thing on the order is that I like the wide geography. I want to go on a road trip. I want to go on a road trip and I want to drive to Florida. And I don't want to drive through three places where they like. I, I, I want to have a regular, I don't, want, I don't want to have a regular, uh, well, when I was in a band, I had long hair. So even though I was white, I was like halfway. I was like halfway bad guy. So I, I have been there. And I, I think that a lot of the trouble we get and a lot of the messing with us that government does is something of a trade-off for having that wide geographic area. And, and that's, that's, that's a place I push back. All right, uh, Wayne Clements, next question. Do you have your mic with you? Can you use yeah, that? Can you hear me? Uh, turn use the button. Hello? Okay, okay, you turned it on. Um, 
This has been great. Um, I'm really enjoying it. Um, a, a problem that I find when I talk to people about this, and it's come up with Dave, who mentioned that we could have competing governments. Did, did I hear you wrong? Okay, so then let's more correctly describe what a government is. Because if I have the ability to move to another government, um, then it's not, you know, he put it on a scale, so I, I wouldn't say not coercive, but it's less coercive. And I think that's where we, can you still call it a government if you're allowed to move away? Uh, if, uh, reasonably. I mean, yes, you can leave the United States. I would consider that impossible for me. But it is, you know, people can do it. But uh, so I, I guess that's, that's all. Yeah, in the microphone you can. <laughs> I, I want to... I want to say once again that I, I want a situation where property owners are making the rules based on all of the interactions that they're having on that property. So imagine I chose to go to George Mason University and not BYU because the rules in the adjudication process at BYU were ridiculous. You can't watch R-rated movies, you can't, all, you can't drink caffeine, you can't have alcohol, whatever it was. So in my world, of competing governance, and I'm not, I'm not against governance, I'm not against rules. People choose the rules under which they live. And those rules are a product of consumers making choices. That's all we're saying. So I chose George Mason's campus with their police department and their enforcement mechanisms because those were fine for me, those were adequate. I didn't choose a million other, other places, not like I had many choices, but I didn't choose a bunch of other places because I found those rules in the, in, the, in the police forces or whatever intolerable. So that's all we're saying is choose the rules under which you live. And I'm, I'm with them on the smaller the, the government, the better. I'm not necessarily against that idea of choosing your rules. I just want to have secession down, almost to, the, down to the individual. Individuals get to choose, choose the rules under which they live. That's a good pace. Dave or John, do you have a response or something to say? The, the, the issue of that we're talking about, anarchy versus minarchy, several hundred years Se several hundred years ago, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have used that word, <laughs> with all due respect. Um, the reason we're having this discussion, and we could not have had it four or five hundred years ago, is because of the example under which we live. Now the question, the, the abstract question that, that is at play in this discussion is, did the United States of America become the greatest civilization in history going from a largely unexplored, unpopulated wilderness to that greatest civilization in history because it either came closest to no government or because it came closest to limited government. And that is the question. If you believe that, that what we take for granted in this country that allows us to sit here and discuss whether there should be no rules imposed by a monopoly or some rules imposed by a monopoly that virtually everyone can agree upon. And that is the question. And our side of the argument is such that the example that was attempted by the founding of this country came closest at the time in our history that it did because it represented the best thinking at the time. 
the, the thinking that was most informed by reason at the time. And it is reasonable to outlaw murder. It is reasonable to outlaw theft. It is reasonable to impose on every parent that they take care of their children and properly feed them to the best of their ability. Those things are reasonable. We come to that position because our thinking is informed by reason. And I would argue that it is reasonable to have rules that everyone must abide by, though they must be extremely limited. And in the absence of having a philosophy that says that ought to be pursued with reason as the guide, you will have that aspect of human nature that I spoke of initially rise to the forefront, markets or not. All right. Thank you. Uh, Ari is the next questioner. Do I have to do something or is it on? It's on. Okay. So I have a, I have a couple of cases for the anarchists that illustrates that, that to me seems especially, that seem especially troubling. Case one, under these competing defense agencies, you kill a homeless guy who does not happen to purchase any defense services. Case two, parents of a girl have her genitals ripped out of her, and their defense agency, of course, is totally fine with this. And the girl herself does not hire any defense agency because she's only, however, seven or seven or whatever. Under a system of competing defense agencies, victims in these like kind of circumstances, if they are to get justice at all, it seems to be by some sort of charitable, you know, we're gonna pay for a charity to go after cases like this. But it's not, there's nothing default about solving cases like that. Where at least with our system of justice that we have, the default standard is those perpetrators are gonna be prosecuted just like anyone else. It doesn't matter if I murder Bill Gates or let's say, person, if you murder Bill Gates or a street bum, you go through the same system of justice, you get this exact same criminal sentence. Now, we all know that the criminal justice system that we have often falls down. A cop can kill a black man in a car because he's reaching for his wallet and obeying the orders of a cop. And the cop gets, you know, if, if he's really unlucky, he gets fired. So we know that the system falls down. But we recognize that as a failure of the existing system contrary to its standards. When the street bum doesn't get justice in, under competing defense agencies, that's not a failure of anarchy. That's how it works. That's how we design it. That's how we expect it to work, unless there's some added, some, something like a charity, charitable defense agency. And cases like that seem really morally bothersome to me. Um, and I think that, that gets to some of the complaints on when people talk about subjectivism of the the subjectivism of it, I think that that's part of what they're trying to get at. So can you, what, how do you deal with that? Is that on? Okay. <laughs> Last part of the question sounded like assuming that um, um, it's, it's really important to have a system that in theory deals with a problem whether or not it actually deals with it and that's going to be better than a system that doesn't in theory deal with it okay it doesn't matter what's true in theory that it doesn't matter at all right so if you care about murder what matters is which system results in fewer murders uh, if there's some class of murders where the system doesn't um doesn't have a theoretical um answer to how that would be prevented, but nevertheless, there are going to be fewer murders. It doesn't matter that there's not a theoretical answer to every class, right? So probably in the anarcho-capitalist society, there would be fewer murders, total. Um, the, most of the murder, there are a lot of murders in our society right now, and the government isn't stopping them. And by the way, the reason is they kind of have no incentive to stop them, because they don't get paid for stopping them. And actually, if the murder rate goes up, they're going to get paid more. If the murder rate goes up, the people who are responsible for stopping murder, their budget is going to go up. Okay, so there's, 
most of the murders that are happening are not murders of homeless people, and they're not murders committed by billionaires because, you know, like they're not, like these are the scenarios that you hear about when people are objecting to anarchy, but those are a very small number. There might be a few cases where somebody gets away with murder, that's true, but there are thousands and thousands of cases where people commit murders right now. There would probably be more of them in the government system than in the anarchist society. Justin, quickly. How often do, are we annoyed when we're talking a, a libertarian or limited government position with a leftist? And they say, well, in your world, how would the poor get health care? Huh? And our position is always, well, the market would provide better health care services than a government monopoly. That's shit, right? This is what you're saying to us. Well, in your system, how would a poor person have a defense agency? And we're saying our system would pro provide better alternatives for the poorest among us to get food, protection services, and defense. So if you're not going to argue for government provision, provision of food, then you can't argue for government provision of, of defense services, because food, you need to survive. So I don't think you want to take, you know, I don't think you want to bite that bullet of saying, well, I'm scared of market conditions and the poor not being able to have food, therefore I need the government to provide food. If you're not willing to say that, I, I don't think you should be willing to say, I'm scared of market conditions and the poor wouldn't have proper defense services, therefore we need to have government defense services. It's a non sequitur. And we, and we in this room hear this all the time. All the time. How will the poor be fed? How will the poor have health care? And we always have the same response. So I'm saying just say that same response to yourself. Dave's got a rebuttal, it looks like. Justin, is this on? Yep. Green? Yeah, the green. Okay, it's on. Here's what I'm afraid of. Terrorists. <laughs> this is a quote from Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard, for those you don't know, is one of the premier anarchists arguing eloquently many times the anarchist. I've got the third best and fourth best in <laughs> Quote, and this is, a, this is an example of what happens when you take the idea that there should not be a monopoly on the use of force, it should be dispersed between competitive institutions. Quote, the parent should not have a legal obligation to feed, clothe, or educate his children since such obligations would entail positive acts coerced upon the parent and depriving the parent of his rights. The parent should have the legal right not to feed the child, i.e. to allow it to die. Now, I know Rothbard. I don't think he would ever support such a thing. But the idea, when there is no overriding moral code upon which you build law, objective law, that applies universally to all, then you get thinking that is consistent logically with the premises at work, but the result can be injustice and tyranny for which you have little response. No, I, I totally disagree with that. Okay. All right, Justin, uh, does it have I to knew, do with... I knew, I knew you would. Does, does it have to do with the context of that quote? Okay, then go ahead. We, we don't... It's not that we don't believe in... We don't believe... It's not that we don't believe in positive obligations. What we don't believe in, it, believe in is unchosen positive obligations. Maria Rothbard was dead wrong about a lot of things, including that. That's the number one thing he was dead wrong about, and I do not support that in any way. I am against unchosen positive obligations. If you have a kid, I'm pro-life. If you have a kid that is an act that you engaged in where you knew that there was a consequence to that act, therefore that responsibility is on you, and if you don't take care of that kid, I'll fuck you up. <laughs> Unless John has a quick response, then we should move on to the next question. On one more thing, uh, you, addressed it, you addressed Ari real well, but 
he, he went a place I was thinking of going, and, and, and you guys did not bring it. Um, private, uh, private security arrangements, the good people of Dearborn, Michigan, uh, decide we should have Sharia. And, and that's their private thing, and there's enough people there that they buy it and they pay for it and stuff like that. I'm sure they're, I'm sure they're real good people, but uh, if you live in Ann Arbor and want your daughter to drive up to Windsor for a rock concert, is it okay that Dearborn, Michigan has, has gone Sharia? I'm sorry if this is a gotcha question, but it's... It's a it's a it's a sideline of something that could certainly happen, and something I'm extremely uncomfortable with. I would not that want that happening near me to have a community near me install Sharia. He kind of started in with the general mutilization, mutilation, and um, that's a, that's a concern I have. All right, who has the next question? Uh, so the reason for my question, the intent of my question is to give you, not to attack uh, or challenge what you're saying, but to give you an opportunity to explain how it would work. Uh, one of the things that you said was very appealing to me. You said individuals could choose the system that they live under. And presumably that means that I could choose a different system than my neighbor. Uh, the state of Colorado had a ballot initiative to split off a part of the state, call it the 51st state, uh, for the purposes of not being governed by the rules of, of Denver, basically, and to allow fracking and to allow gun ownership and that sort of thing. Um, so how would that, how could that be practically affected where you had two neighbors, uh, you know, basically, I want to have, frac I want to allow fracking on my property and she wants to allow marijuana smoking. Not that I have a problem with that, but uh, I offered. I once offered to trade to a friend. We'll let you smoke pot if you let us drill for oil. He said, "Well, what's the fun in smoking pot if it's not illegal?" <laughs> uh, but I mean, don't you? I mean, the the idea of government close to the people goes back to the founding, and the the fifty laboratories of democracy, as have been alluded to, are a great idea. But we, for interstate commerce is one example. Another example, in Colorado, uh, we have a state law that uh, concealed carry has to be allowed in all, in all counties, in all cities, unless you specifically post it. Uh, we, we're trying to have some sort of harmonization of rules so that you don't have to make the circuitous route when you travel and go around Dearborn, Michigan. So how do you affect what is the practical way that you can subscribe, basically, to different systems of government that are contradictory? Who wants to start with that one? No one? Yeah, we, we have to compete with each other. Um, so, uh, um, if there's a demand for uniformity of law, then, you know, the market can assess that demand and there will be attempts to provide it as there are attempts to provide whatever consumers want. So suppose that, um, law consumers, as it were, which is all of us, um, get upset when the law changes a lot as they move around. Uh, if you go down to the mall, you don't want there to be radically different laws. Well, then the people who are providing laws would have an economic incentive to try to make the law uniform. That is, they would try to make their law similar to the kinds of laws that the people who were coming to their property were expecting to have. Um, and, um, I mean, in, in the governmental system, the people who are making the laws just have a lot less responsiveness to the demands of the consumer. There's, there's a economic mechanism in the market system for people to respond to the demands of the consumer. There is some mechanism in the democratic system, but it's just a lot less effective. 
right? And the reason it's a lot less effective is um, it depends upon voting. And most of the voters have no idea what's going on. And the voters, most of the voters don't care because they know it's extremely unlikely that their vote will make a difference, et cetera. Okay, but in the market system, you can actually just choose a different provider, right? And then you get that. Is other, that good? That I liked it. How about the other team? <laughs> okay. Megan, did you have the next question? Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Stand up on the chair. So I know I'm only five two. Can you guys see me over there? Oh, full disclosure. Tell us who you who you're dating. Oh, I am dating one of these uh, <laughs> wonderful speakers. I won't disclose exactly who. Just um, the age range. I actually know part of his opinion on this because we've discussed it before. But uh, first of all, thank you for your thoughts. I've appreciated everyone's on the panel. Um, for the three of you who I'm not dating, I would be interested to know, um, as, as I think I'm a, I, I'm a philosophical anarchist, I have a really big problem because the idea of property rights troubles me sometimes, um, and that's because uh, being a part of the marginalized groups in society by being a woman when it comes to leading and how society is built. Um, I wonder how we resolve the issue of property rights for marginalized citizens because as we currently have it, the government basically has control over all property that isn't privately dispersed. So how can a marginalized group of people become independently wealthy or become uh, or, or progress without being able to get themselves into this whole idea of, of owning and uh, establishing property because it's, it's it's very hard to see from a a woman's perspective it's it's very young that women are leading and at the top of their ranks and making the amount of money that women are today so i would be curious to know what you guys think about that <laughs> so justin should not answer this question first once again <laughs> I'm kidding, Justin, if you want to, but uh, Team Anar Minarchy, do you have a response? I, I, I just wonder if we have a, uh, a, an agreement here. I, I worry that so much of the impedance to progress there has probably come from government. Um, and, and so I, I, I guess I, I don't know that I see this as a minarchy, anarchy thing. Um, I am a, a huge believer in property rights. It's a, it's a foundation of, of everything I believe. Uh, and I think that's ultimately the solution to marginalized groups is to get in that because that's a place where they can. You know, yeah, if they're underrepresented, that's a problem, but they're not, you know, they're not zero. And I think there's, I think there's room for progress there. And you know that's a thing that I see the private, private certainly doing better, better than government. Um, minarchy guy doesn't see a big government role there. I think that's a you know continuation of the, of the market for me. Dave, Michael, go ahead. Well, obviously, property is the foundation for all human rights. If you don't have the right to property. You have no human rights because ultimately the thing that you own most privately and personally is your own life. But I agree with John. It's not a question of government and no government. You're absolutely right. The government owns most of the land that's not privately owned is owned by the government and you can't simply utilize it even if you've got a wonderful idea. Uh, it doesn't belong and, and so in that sense it limits your opportunity. In this, in this discussion, there's a fundamental problem to begin with, in that both of us are arguing on behalf of an ideal vision. We, none of us can point to an example except in, in very limited capacities. So that whether it be anarchy or some sort of, of limited government that is limited to individ, protection of individual rights, which I don't know of any that are, there's nothing we can point to, especially our side, 
on behalf of our argument. But in response to your question, I would simply point out that, that women's equality was not something even considered a few short hundred years ago. And in, in the West, in America in particular, that has now risen to the point where the awareness of the inequality and the tr attempts to do something about, them, about it, um, however poorly or efficaciously done, is a product of the very society of limited government that we're living in. All right, Michael, Justin. Uh, so, well, I'm going to comment more generally on the subject of prejudice because that's what I thought about. I didn't think specifically about property rights. Uh, um, my my comment is that the democratic government um, is more vulnerable to prejudice than the anarcho-capitalist society. The reason is that in the democratic system, um, voters can afford to vote on their prejudice. They vote on the basis of their prejudice. If the majority of the society is prejudiced against some minority, then they get to impose that on the entire society. Uh, how is the market system different? Well, in the market, so in the democratic system, your marginal cost for casting the prejudice vote is basically zero because the probability that you're going to swing the outcome of the election is basically zero. In the market system, uh, you, you have to pay for your prejudice. So if you decide, um, you know, I, I think uh, I don't like immigrants, I'm not gonna trade with immigrants, then you bear the cost of that personally. In the democratic system, you can say, I don't like immigrants, I'm going to vote that nobody gets to trade with immigrants. Your marginal cost from casting that vote is approximately zero because it's probably not going to be decisive. In the other case where you personally decide not to trade with immigrants, you, like, you definitely just bear the cost of that decision. So if the prejudice is irrational, then the market system penalizes it, and the democratic system does not, right? Um, so, uh, and, you know, this is related to the point that the market system is not actually majoritarian. You only need to have a market niche. Uh, so if there are some people who are not prejudiced and then they go ahead and they hire the minorities that the majority don't want to hire, um, then they're going to outcompete the people who are prejudiced because they're going to get good workers at lower prices, you know, because of the prejudice of the other employers. Okay, great. Uh, Bill, you have the mic. Bill. Should be on. Denver, represent. Well, let's see. Hold on. Right now. Hello? Speak, speak it. Speak it. <laughs> Hello? Is it working now? It is. I would just like to offer a couple of observations for the debating teams to, uh, to discuss. One is the difference between bottom up and top down. I believe that markets are a bottom-up phenomenon. They occur naturally, spontaneously. They are not driven by any central power. But yet, the innumerable um, rational decisions, or irrational, of people within a market causes the market to have a direction that is not centrally planned, but is beneficial to all the people. I believe that the anarchists are arguing that markets are, are much more positive than the top-down opposite. I think the top-down concept of the minarchists leaves you open to the question of, gee, how do we get people who are moral enough to run all of this power? And I would submit that the top, that's the problem with the top-down model, and that the way to get rid of it is to not to have it. I would love to hear both of the sides comment on that. Well, I agree with I, I agree with almost everything. I, I I'm a huge market fan, and you know uh, that's the thing. But I am arguing for a limitation, and I'm sorry, I'm still not convinced 
that the uh, private system is not majoritarian. I, I, I think it would be. You're going to hire your you're going to hire your security company. Your you know. I, I always let the the one I always liked was Walmart versus Target. You know, you get you're going to you're going to hire your you're going to hire your protection company. That's going to be majoritarian. Not not everybody's going to agree with that, and people are not. And to put no kind of guardrail on the top of that, you know, uh, are, are we going to have slavery? Um, you know, I, are we are we going to have some of the things that we have constitutional protection against? Is that going to be okay if there's 200 guys in the neighborhood and 101 guys in the neighborhood say they want it? Is is that? Is that going to be okay? Or some of the things that we enjoy, you know, some of the newer things, gay marriage, something like that, are those going to be, you know, unavailable in any place where a majority of the people choosing the security apparatus for that area think think it's not? I, I think we need some protections on top against uh, majoritarianism. I would stress that the system that you're describing sounds like an election, where 51% gets to impose their will on the rest of the people. What we're saying on this side, on the market side, is, that, is not that markets are infallible and markets are utopia. There will be murders, there will be discrimination, and there will be bigotry. But in this market system, people pay for their bigotry. You have to pay to indulge your discrimination. How does that happen? Well, imagine that you're an employer that hates red-headed people. And you say, I'm never going to hire a redhead ever. They have well, no souls. They have no souls, for example. <laughs> we, all, we all know this is a fact, but in order to indulge this, in order to indulge this discrimination against redheads, I, I, I shrink my supply of employees by a by all the redheads that I'm choosing not to hire. The same goes for women, the same goes for minorities. If you're a landlord and you refuse and you just hate people that look like Wayne, I'm never gonna hire people that look like Wayne. Guess what? The, you're, you're limiting the amount of people that you're going to, you're going to allow in your, in your tenement. So every time you indulge some racist or bigoted preference in our system, you're punished for it. It doesn't mean that it's not going to exist. Of course it's going to exist. But every time you want to indulge your bigot, bigoted position in the democracy system, in the top-down system, all you have to do is get 51% of your buddies who are also racist, vote it, into, vote it into law, and impose that will on everybody. That's the difference. Over here, you pay for it. Over there, you don't pay for it. No. All right. <laughs> Dave, did you have a response? Or I hate to give it to John right now. He's, he's <laughs> we'll, move, we'll move on to the next question. John? How do you guys deal with conflict of visions? Two segments to the question. One globally, and then one more on an individual basis or a small group basis. And an example globally, let's pretend that all of North America is in some minarchist or anarchist system, but South America is run by some dictator and he wants to nuke all of North America. How do you deal with that? There are two conflicting visions. What is a market way to deal with that? And then on a more individual basis, let's pretend that there's two different groups. One group over here who's a bunch of murderers and that's their ideals. That's the system they want to live under. They like murder. They like coming over and popping you up or whatever. Uh, but this group over here doesn't. So two conflicting visions, completely conflicting, even um, resulting in death. Um, how is that handled? Who wants to start with that one? <laughs> Probably the anarchists. Go ahead. I'm just. I'm going to comment on the um, uh, South American who wants to nuke North America. Um, 
I'd like to point out that actually all of the nuclear weapons that have ever existed were built by governments. It was a government that designed this. And uh, if the human species is extinguished, it will almost certainly be extinguished by a government, uh, either by nuclear weapons or by some even more fearsome weapons. And I'm sure we have people working on them right now, right? <laughs> whatever will be the next even more deadly weapons. Um, I don't have a... Um, I don't have a plan that will absolutely prevent anyone from using a nuclear weapon, okay, but I think like just having the government increases the risk, right? Good point. I just want to add, the, 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 case, the case about being scared of war, if you're scared of war, the last thing you want is a government that taxes people, where they can offload the costs of the war machine onto people that have no choice on whether they can fund it. So if you're scared of people building weapons, coming up with new weapons, using those weapons, this is what's happening right now. A lot of your, a lot of your paycheck is going to bomb women and children in wedding parties in Pakistan, whether you like it or not. I don't, I don't see how what you're asking is, okay. is, is, is not what's happening right now. The question is not about war. It's about the conflicting visions of this place who won't have nukes or whatever with this place over here that's a dictatorship. I mean, globally, we how does have a, How does the state solve that? I don't understand. I'm not saying that the state is solving that. I'm okay. asking how the, you would, you would solve it. Right, how markets would solve it. We, we do have a global uh, conflict of visions. back to something that, that Bill has, had said. All of these governments did not come about by accident. They were designed, if you will, from the top down, Bill. Okay? The unique attribute of ours was that, yes, it, des it was designed in the context you mean it from the top down, but it arose from the voluntary exchanges that were going on in the colonies. And it came about, Miss Questioner, because in endless examples of attempted voluntary exchanges and exchanges that came about, someone Up with a way that it happened. Now, will attempts in America and in the Western world in general, these top down solutions would generally so that we have an attempt to limit the top-down solution, not eliminate it, limit it, and codify a body of law consistent, most consistent that we can imagine with reason. And that leads to the, the word that you just skimmed over in your question had to do with morality. Reason informs morality. Morality informs politics. If all that was necessary for justice and truth and order and stability, for the freedom to engage in economic transactions, then bottoms-up freedom would have won long ago. Because the efficacy of are demonstrable beyond measure. Okay. Who's the next questioner? Well, actually, um, if you would address the second part of her question as to the more localized um, aspects of that, you, you have a set of people, a group of people.
do that or somebody? I'd like to hear how markets would solve that. First, that didn't answer part of the question. So, uh, how do we how do we solve the problem of people having conflicts of visions? Uh, well, the answer there is no political solution to that. No social system will stop that from happening. And if there are people who want to attack others who don't agree with them, then they're going to do it, whether we have a government or not. Now, I mean, as to the example that you just said, uh, I don't like examples that are bizarre and totally unrealistic because I think it doesn't matter if we have an answer to that. So there aren't a bunch of people who think murder and rape is cool, uh, but there are like, uh, you know, Islamic extremists. So what are we gonna do about that? Um, in the, what, would, what would in fact happen in the anarcho-capitalist society is probably they would form their own enclaves. They'd probably be like Muslim neighborhoods and maybe they would have their own laws. Maybe they would do a bunch of bad, unjust things in their own neighborhoods. And probably the neighboring people would think that's fucked up, but they probably wouldn't do anything about it because they don't want to start a violent conflict. And it's just how it goes. Uh, and, you know, nothing is going to be perfect. So, that so in that sense, the, the market system... Oh, I have, I have to speak, speak into the microphone. I'm the one that's been doling it out, I should know. So in that instance, um, you know, religious sect of any kind, um, so if they're doing things within their own community, I mean, at that point, that extremism extinguishes itself. Look, look at North Korea right now. North Korea is doing horrible, atro like, complete atrocities to their people. And we're, and we're looking at them going, hmm, what are we going to do about it? All this stuff about, oh, we need to, we need, we need to protect so and so and so. But we've been letting North Korea suffer for how long? No one's, stand, no one's going in there. So... Here's what, how I want to reframe the issue in our minds. What we're saying is there are, uh, there are, there needs to be a process by which we find solutions to these problems. The problem with their vision is that the top-down approach is one person or one organization deciding how we deal with problems, with social problems. Our position is that's a bad way to figure out problems. We know that markets come to a lot of great solutions that we all know and love, and, and we can't figure out how the hell a pencil's made because of the market, the market process figures out how this is made, how this, how this cell phone is made, and over time, the market shakes out through prices, profit and loss, entrepreneurship, dis price discovery, all that good stuff that we love. It figures out the best solution to that problem at that time. And when that solution doesn't work, next solution comes in. So I'm not, uh, we're not against solutions. We're not against people banding together, figuring stuff out, living under rules, all that stuff. I'm against one body or one person deciding what that solution should be and imposing it on us. Because I don't think that one person is going to get it right. The odds that they know what the heck they're talking about, they're not very good, especially when Hillary Clinton got elected. I mean, this is what we're talking about. You, cre you create a state that can do all this stuff to us, who do you think is going to be attracted to it? Hillary Clinton. So, ooh, ooh, ooh. yeah, or Donald Trump. That I mean. sounds like a good summation. Uh. Other team, do you have a response? Okay. Yeah. All right, before we leave, uh, I have a question, and I want to get away from the pragmatic side of things. Like what's the, you know, the on best, the net system that we should have? And I guess my question is really only directed at the anarchists in this case. Oh, no, <laughs> well, it's, it's not a bias question necessarily, but um, on, a, on a deep philosophical level, if you're talking about markets and performance, um, you know, competing markets actually producing really good results, things that people want, uh, people, things that people need, and things that are uh, efficacious, of good quality. You know, these are the kinds of things that markets are, are known for, uh, producing results that are good and that things that people want. 
So if that's all true of markets, and we're talking about markets for justice, which is kind of the, the philosophical underpinnings of all of this, if there is, and, and if you also believe that there are some, uh, you know, objective uh, immoralities, like murder, for instance, um, why would we need a market to actually go towards those philosophic ideals, the, those, those natural kind of um, restraints that we see or we want to impose in nature? Why would we need to go, if we can identify those objective wrongs, why would we need markets to actually figure those out? And wouldn't it be the case that if, if we have competing markets that they're all uh, competing for the same end? Why don't we just start at the end and just identify those few things that we all agree on and go from there? If we, if we all know that we need food to survive, why, don't we, why do we need markets to provide the food? You're, you're, you're telling me something that we all know, which can be exactly attributed to, to food. We all know we need food to survive, so why do we need markets for food? There's your answer. We need markets for food because there's no way for a centralized, central plan, centrally planned system to produce the right amount of food in the right amount of places for the right amount of pri prices with the right amount of labor, doing the right amount of, with the right amount of capital. These are all things that have to be fleshed out in the market process. I think this is a fundamental misunderstanding of how important the market process is. Well, and how it, it, it does this just as well as it figures out any other protection service that you might need. We all understand that murder is wrong. We're all going to subscribe to the agency that outlaws murder and will protect us from that. But in your, in your mind, you need, to, you need to figure out what is the best way to provide the mechanisms by which we protect ourselves from theft and murder. Yeah, I and the best to... way to do that is the market process. So in my example, I intentionally talked about justice, not food. In, in specific things like, like murder, things that we already know are wrong. And you said that people would actually subscribe to a service where, where things like murder would be okay. Are you then saying that you're, you're moral nihilists? I don't, no, 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 no. I, okay. I don't, I don't think that, I, I think that we all agree that we need food to survive, just like we all agree that Why food? Wrong. You go back to food. I'm talking justice. Because you're trying to say that, oh, I love markets when it comes to A, B, C, D, blah, 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 to X, Y, but then you suddenly abandon the market process, abandon supply and demand, abandon the price system, abandon an entrepreneurial discovery when it comes to one particular service. Yes. It's just a service. That's all it is. Are you, we as human beings need goods and services. Apply the same economic reasoning that you do to bananas, that you do to prices, to, to, to protection services so, that protect so you from So murder, murder would be a service. Then. You're choosing to live under laws. And as I explained before, that the, the way that we discover law is the same way that, same way that we discover prices. If you're going to make an argument that there's a correct law, then you're also making an argument that there's a correct price for something. And that has no. to be a bottom-up thing. Uh, so I, I, I think this might, might be the answer to your question. First, um, there are some people who are bad is a relative minority, or is a kind of a small minority of society, but nevertheless, this minority of, of society who are just bad and just want to live as predators on other people can create a lot of trouble. And, and so like, that's one reason why we need the market to provide protection. Uh, second, there are some things that are actually not obvious. Uh, there are some sort of broad principles that nearly everyone agrees on, like murder is wrong. But um, in the complexities of human life, people run into particular circumstances in which they have disputes about what's right or wrong. Uh, and then you need a process for resolving that. And you know, that, that's the place for the arbitrators. And it is often not obvious and requires somebody who's particularly qualified at thinking about human problems to, to try to resolve it, right? Now, the, the market process doesn't guarantee that you get the objectively correct norms. Um, neither does the government process, but the argument would be that the market process um, is more likely to give a reasonable approximation. And why is that? Because the arbitrators who are making rulings, um, they want their ruling to be perceived as fair by the majority of other people out there who weren't involved in the case who might someday need to use an arbitrator. 
and they will only go to this arbitrator if they, if they can agree with the other party that they're having a dispute with that this is a fair arbitrator, right? So there's a, like, there's a market incentive to try to make decisions that are widely perceived as fair. Notice, by the way, that actual judges and legislators don't really have that pressure. Other side, do you have? Well, I said it was really only for the anarchists, so I would be surprised if you have a rebuttal. But go ahead, Dave. It looks like you have something to say. I would, I would respond that, that whether it's food, justice, or whatever you want to talk about, in order for production to occur of that good or service, and in order... Bring that down so you're not oh. breathing in it. In order, in order for that good or service to be produced and for the market for it to thrive, it needs to have an overall stability and order in it, the threat of which by any group or individual is not sufficient to deter it. And in going back to the, the young lady's question, in the absence of collective defense and preservation of that stability and that market, it will cease to exist. It will be taken over by force. Reason will not win. Force will win. And so the hallmark of a conflict of visions is the peaceful resolution of that vision. And if if in the absence of that peaceful resolution being able to be manifested, whether it's by government or whoever, then brute force is going to solve the issue. The only issue is who wields it and why. And while I agree that you can endlessly make the case that governments wield it badly and unjustly, in my view of this issue, whether it's markets from the bottom up or imposition from the top down, we're going to end up in the same place with an authority that is uncontestable except by force that decides what's right and what's wrong. Pretty good closing statement, and, and we heard a closing statement over here, sort of, unless you want to throw in like 30 seconds real quick just to make it fair and then we'll release everybody. Smash Justin, the Michael. <laughs> Smash the state, okay. I, I, just, I, I just wanna mention two things. Number one, uh, there is a living example, if you wanna read about it, uh, about what we're talking about. It's called, there's a book called The Not So Wild Wild West. And so this book explains how there was property rights, uh, rights in animals, water rights, and all the rights that we as human beings need to live in a, in a peaceful society, those existed before government got to the western part of the United States. So read the not so wild, wild west. There's also, because I'm an econ nerd, and I know everybody in this room is thinking, well, how would the, how would the market provide X, Y, and Z? I had to know that myself. So I read David Friedman's epic book, The, the Machinery of Freedom. David Friedman is Milton Friedman's son. David Friedman wrote in the 70s, the machinery of freedom. It's been updated three times since then. And he goes in to explain how you can have a market for law, a market for justice, a market for protection, and all that stuff. So if you want to learn about how other theorists have, have talked about this, and historians have looked at cases about this, the not-so-wild Wild West and the machinery of freedom are great places to start. And I'd end with that. And also, and, and also Michael Humer's book. What is the name of that book, please, for the entire audience? Read the name of the book. The Problem of Political Authority. It's, very good. it's on Amazon. Available on Amazon. It, it's very, very good. My last question was actually going to be book recommendations. So John oh, and David, do you have any? That's what I wanted to close with, since he threw books out. Go ahead, John. Uh, since, since he threw books out, I wanted to do one more. I talked about Randy Barnett, and I, I blew my time because I was going on so long. Uh, Randy Barnett wrote uh, uh, Structure of Liberty in the 90s. It's the second best anarchy book. Um, but he came around a couple years ago and wrote The Republican Constitution, which, which is the kind of heart of what I wanted to talk about. I don't know how well I did it. But the idea that 
we grab from the, the declaration the correct uh, purpose of government and look at the Constitution and the ways that it has successfully, that, that it has successfully implemented that. So I would toss on your reading list Randy Barnett's The Republican Constitution. It's real different for libertarians because it's, it's not the agrarian, total decentralized Jeffersonian. It's a, it's a different look. It really changed uh, a lot of things for me, but it's a very good book from a guy who wrote a great anarchy book. And then, Dave, do you have any recommendations for us? You know them all. It, that would be the Ayn Rand anthology. So anything by Ayn Rand, especially. I'll, I'll make a closing, a closing thing that Rand talked about. Why don't you use the microphone? It's right there in your hand. OK, is that it? <laughs> I'll make a closing, closing remark. And it's the most important thing Rand told me, or taught me. And that is politics, however it's described, whether it's in a company or in a, in a government, it's driven by morality. Your idea of what is right, wrong, good, bad, just, unjust, and so forth. When you decide those issues, then you will prescribe and, and support politics consistent with that. And in my judgment, what went wrong with our, our admittedly uh, uh, ineffectual in many ways attempt at limited government is it was not supported by a morality consistent with individual freedom. And when you, when you marry those two things, then you get what these gentlemen have so effectively argued for. You get the dominance of markets, not 100%. But 99 or 98, whatever. Anyway, thank you. Good enough. There you have your four book recommendations. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. August 14th, we'll have Kathleen Chandler from the Independence Institute. She's going to be talking about the local government initiative. And then August 28th, we're going to have Thomas Cranowitter out here. He's been out a few times. He's got a new book. It's a satire, and it's called Save the Swamp. So I've invited Tom out to come talk about that new book, and he will have copies for purchase and for signing. So once again, thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Bye.